Good. So I'm here on the Vendée Globe pontoon talking to Simon Kerwin, who is one of the British Golden Globe Race 2022 skippers aboard his boat, Clara. Um, first of all, Simon, just talk to me about why you chose the boat and what you've done to make her ready for the race. Well, uh, I mean, I started looking at boats during the last uh, race took the opportunity to have a look at how the boats were performing. So for boats that were readily available in the UK or Europe, there was the, the Rustler 36, which uh, I was obviously doing very well in the last Golden Globe race. There was the Biscay 36, there were three, uh, th three entries there, all catch rigged, and uh, trade winds uh, and a uh, selection of other boats that were permitted. And then from then on, it got a bit more coincidence. So. Uh, I found this boat, it's in good condition, uh, in good cruising condition, needed a few modifications for going around the world. It was built in Emsworth, which is where I live in the UK. I think we couldn't really tell in the last Golden Globe how the performance of the Rustler 36, which we, that's, that, that's the gold standard, if you like, because it uh, finished first, second and third. Um, but we didn't really get a good chance to see how other boats would perform and this, this Golden Globe is going to be much more interesting I think because we've got a much more varied selection of boats, the North American boats with long water line length but heavier displacement uh, and uh, well we hope to see what the Biscay can do if it, uh, if, if it gets out of the Atlantic. And, and why the Biscay 36? Why choose that boat? Uh, it's, it's a light boat, it's about a tonne lighter than, uh, than the Rustler. Uh, which has its advantages and its disadvantages. So one of the, my concerns is there was only one Biscay that made it down into the Southern Ocean last time and it was rolled substantially, lost both masts and, uh, and, uh, and the boat was eventually lost, although it floated around for a few months in the, in, in the Indian Ocean, showing that it was a good strong boat. Um, so she's strong, she's light displacement, uh, on paper, she's as fast as the Rustler, so that makes her as fast as any boat in the fleet, I think. Um, I say I think because the only chance we've had to, to test them out was in the prologue race from Spain to here, and certainly the boat seemed to go pretty well, so um, I'm happy with, happy with the choice. Well, Yandy, you came second in that prologue race. Yes, I had the advantage of having a pretty good crew as well, uh, and my daughter Nikki, it was lovely to be sailing with her again, which she was reminding me it's a, it's about eight years since we, we last raced together. Uh, so that was really nice. Um, but yeah, the boat, boat seemed to go well off the start line in the light airs. And uh, when we pushed it a bit on the, on the downward legs under spinnaker, certainly picked up well and we're, I think, one of the fastest boats in the fleet. So uh, having said that, with two people on board and two experienced people on board who we were pushing harder than I will be pushing in the, in, in the race itself, which sounds a bit perverse, but that, that, that's the case. I think if we pushed at the rate we did in the prologue, we, we wouldn't arrive at the end of the Golden Globe race. <laughs> okay, and tell me how you've made um, Clara race ready. Right, well, there are certain changes. I mean, the first thing is quite, quite obvious one that you take off uh, 46 years of uh, cruising clobber and suddenly she lifts out of the water by, by several inches, uh, most, most of which was sort of anchors, chains, capstans and things like that. Uh, but also um, she's, she's been converted to cutter rig, so she's now got staysail, um, which is going to be, a, so I'll have two furled headsails on board all the time, so I'm not anticipating taking off those sails or possibly even the mainsail for the whole race. They're going to stay up, um, stay up reefed or rolled but but basically not looking at changing sails I don't like the idea of handling sails in the conditions we're going to be uh, sailing in and it also we know from the experience of last time that it takes a lot of water down when you take them all down below and then you've got moisture issues and so I mean we'll have moisture issues anyway but there's no point in exaggerating them so that was one of the changes uh, and that all was uh, done in conjunction with some of the safety requirements so one of the main requirements was putting in a crash bulkhead so that meant getting rid of the anchor locker and everything forward taking off the foredeck effectively and uh, and that allowed us to put in a good crash bulkhead and then reinstate the foredeck having put in uh, the bulkhead the crash bulkhead became the the, the um, mounting point for the stay still four stay and also for a i've got a third four stay which is partly security but also to be able to run up a hanked on 
light weather Genoa and, and, and the storm jib, if I choose to put it there. So that's all a big advantage. Moving back, the foot of the mast was actually uh, was, was all rotten. It's deck step mast, but between the layers of uh, fiberglass, all the, all the plywood in between was rotten. So again, that was carved out and reinstated. Um, then I mentioned already that we'd reinforced up forward for the forestay and the new stay still um, chain plate, but all the um, the hanging uh, knees for the um, chain plates for the shrouds have all been done. I mean, initially they're a little bit of plywood, loosely fiberglass to deck and hull from the un underneath. Um, so those are now fairly substantial. We can have a look at those when we go down below, but they're all hidden in cupboards, so the cupboards have come out and, 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 and that work's been done. Then, other than that, it's sort of replumbing and redoing the electrics. It's um, fairly major changes here that she was wheel steer before, and um, I'm, I'm a fan of tiller steering. And it's a particular advantage that um, when things get a bit miserable in the cockpit, you can hide a little bit under the canopy and I've got uh, on this canopy I've got a back to it that zips onto here which will give a bit of protection uh, and so one will be able to steer when one need, need to hand steer. So I think quite a lot of the steering I'll be doing will be um, power assisted steering so using the hydrovane but adding touches with the tiller because that seems to work quite well. The hydrovane rudder is well aft so it works well. Uh, as opposed to the, the large rudder that's attached to the keel and, and really is, is, is pretty hard work and not really making the boat go very fast. So there'll be a lot of the steering will be done on the hydrovane rudder, which also acts, of course, as the emergency rudder as well. So, um, so reinforcements again at the backstays, putting in running backstays, changing the rig. So I mentioned that she's gone cutter, but she's got a new mast uh, and, and new rigging. Um, for the event, which is pretty much a prerequisite for this this course. And and um, storm as far as your storm tactics go, um, what are you thinking? In terms of survival, mm -hmm. um, I mean the trouble is you you can have theories about this, but until you've been down there and tested it, tested the boat um, and the wave patterns, because of course they're going to be different in each each one and it's where you've got the cross waves that and, and waves that are that are inevitably at an angle to the wind as uh, as the depressions move past us because we unlike the Amoka boats we we just have to wait for what's coming at us and we can't move with the depressions particularly well or get out of the way so we just have to accept that we're going to get some pretty awkward wave conditions and that I mean in in many ways that's my biggest fear or concern is that um, I don't know how the boat performs uh, the one Biscay got down last time it had had issues uh, as did all the boats because they got caught in a particularly nasty storm that came in incredibly quickly which meant that the wave patterns were particularly complex and uh, and and they were caught in in breaking seas, massive breaking seas and large winds. And, and a, a, the boat I know has a slight tendency, I mean inevitably the hydrovane can't really cope with those sort of conditions. Quite often the vane is being uh, shadowed by the, uh, the waves that are creeping up behind so it hasn't got all the information it needs or the wind pressure it needs. And, and this designer boat really with the uh, with the stern section there is a danger of the stern getting caught and then it being pushed around and then you get get put, pushed broadside to to the waves so how do you get around that well one one way is hand steer but there's a limit to how long you can hand steer um, another thing and part of my design uh, thoughts are that firstly you remove as much windage aft on the boat so that the stern isn't being blown around as well so hence I've gone with the flexible uh, canopy which will just collapse and so no protection when that's down um, and uh, the, the cutter rig or sloop rig, single masted uh, rig uh, means that I don't have all that extra drill windage aft so that's one of the big big issues uh, then there are various options uh, of running drogues or warps so I've got options of running those but I'm not sure if I will um, 
uh, and more of the, the, the mindset of reduce the sale, put a little bit of sale up forward to keep, try and keep the, the bow pointing downwind, uh, reduce its tendency to, to slew round in the, in the waves and just try and keep moving. Uh, but I do have a drogue and warps if, uh, if I think the conditions permit. It's very difficult to test that out. I've been out in, uh, in rough conditions in Biscay to, to see what happens. But you don't get the same waves, you don't get the length of waves, you don't get the height of waves, and, and every, uh, every storm is different. So um, it'll have to be a bit of a question of, of testing it and seeing what works. And what do you think gives you the edge in this race? Oh, I, I don't necessarily think that I've got the edge on any of these guys. They're all well-prepared boats. Um, I mean, it is a race, but the primary objective of all of us is to get round. And um, there are some boats that are fantastically prepared with two of everything, or in some cases, uh, three of everything. And uh, so uh, I wouldn't say that I'm particularly better prepared than anybody else. I have a slight advantage that I've had the boat now for three and a half years. I know it quite well. I did my refit of the boat after having sailed my qualifier back in 2020. So I had a pretty good idea of what I was trying to achieve. Um, and I've got good sails, good mast um, and a good boat. So, um, and, and re reasonably good preparation. Um, so that I think hope gives me an edge in terms of finishing and then the probably less than half the fleet who are really out to to be super competitive because it's uh, a bit like uh, the first event uh, there, were, there were people who were trying to to go for speed and uh, there were people who were just trying to be first round or to get round and uh, and primary objective is to get round. So Simon's just going to give us a boat tour now um, to show us his Biscay 36 Clara. So Simon, we'll start from the cockpit. Right, so starting, uh, we're going, we're starting aft, um, we've got the hydrovane wind vane, which is the primary self-steering system uh, for the boat, um, put solidly mounted on the transom. Um, not taking uh, redundancy in terms of uh, complete spare units, unlike some, some, some people. I'm putting confidence in the design. They did well last time round. Um, it's solidly... One, one of the modifications I've made is that it always has the possible of, possibility of hand steering from this little stub of, uh, of tiller here. But I have a length of stainless steel tubing, which makes a tiller which comes to here, and then a tiller extension on that. So if I want to, from pretty much anywhere in the cockpit, I can steer with the hydrovane, which is both the security, but also it's a, it's a much more sensitive rudder than uh, the, the original rudder attached to the keel. And beside that, you can see the uh, Watt and Sea uh, hydro generator. So those are, there, are, there are a fair number of those in the fleet now. It seems a bit perverse that we're using modern technology in a race that is uh, supposed to be only using technology existing in 1968. But anything that goes towards security uh, is a key element of security is, is permitted. And so we have solar panels um, and uh, have the, the, the hydro generator. And some boats also have uh, wind, uh, wind generators. Um, I've selected the Watt and Sea. I hope to be mainly using solar panels. Uh, the slight downside to that is that I only have one rigid fixed position solar panel and that's right under the boom and behind the mast. So it doesn't get huge amounts of sun. Uh, but it's the only place that I can mount solar panels without encumbering the comfort and pleasure and, and efficiency of sailing. So then I have uh, pretty basic systems of, uh, of mobile um, solar panels which at the moment are facing well away from the sun so not doing very much but that's okay because we're not using power and I've got two two places that those plug into in the cockpit and they can go anywhere on the boat and so in total I've got uh, 210 watts of solar power uh, plus the 300 watts of the uh, watt and sea which should be uh, sufficient for the modest requirements of, uh, of energy on these boats which aren't equipped with, with autopilots and uh, aren't equipped with uh, all modern technology. So moving back we've talked about uh, the tiller a little bit already 
but there, so the, the wheel which used to be here, and these boats were designed as catch rigs, so originally the, the second mast would go here and the wheel behind, and when I bought the boat she, had, uh, she was equipped with wheel. Uh, but that's an awful lot of weight and as I've said previously I much prefer tiller steering so uh, that was a little bit of an operation, slight modification to things to, uh, to, to convert her to tiller steering but um, pleasingly that went well. Then otherwise in the cockpit she's now got self-tailing winches, she's got a, the main sheet track um, across here has gone because apart from not being particularly efficient uh, as, a, as, a, as a main sheet system, it completely blocked the companion way. So that has gone and been replaced with what one sees on a number of boats now, a system of a dual uh, main sheet, so fixation, f fixings on, on either side, which gives total control of sail shape. It's, uh, I mean, uh, it's, uh, I'm really pleased with how that is performing. And it also means that for probably about 80% of the time, we're just sailing with one main sheet, which is the downwind main sheet, and, uh, and you've got a completely unencumbered cockpit. I suspect that I've probably got one of the nicest cockpits in terms of working space uh, without the mast, without the wheel, and without main sheet and things. It's a, it's a large and comfortable uh, cockpit to, to operate in. Because after all, this is supposed to be, we're supposed to be doing this for pleasure as well as a race and uh, endurance. And, uh, and that's quite an important part of it. You've got to be out there for anywhere between 220 and 250 days. It has to be, it has to be livable. Mm -hmm. So apart from that, we'll notice the, what appears to be a ladder, but is, is actually just the, um, the, it's the antenna for the HF radio. Uh, on this, it's slightly complicated to have a slightly larger ladder section. We can get a ladder because with the split back stay, um, and the insulator uh, a bit higher than on some boats uh, it means you've got this which is a, a bit of a fragile element to the boat and I've already broken it once um, so I'm hopeful we've now got a system that, that, that will hold the course. Um, she's now got running backstays which is a function of her having a staysail and so that supports the rig either in uh, really bad conditions or, or any time that we're sailing with the staysail and, and reef rig. Um, so th I think that is pretty much it for the cockpit. I mentioned uh, the, uh, s this uh, dodger or spray hood so that has a zip-in section which comes back and attaches here to the main sheet um, points and so that gives me a little cuddy uh, for some of the conditions when it's colder and wetter and I'm um, hoping that works well, that's obviously a new modification. All the cockpit lockers have been sealed so um, internally because there's a large space within the hull which if cockpit locker top got ripped off or somehow filled with water you could rapidly take on huge amounts of water so those are now sealed that's a requirement for the race and in fact there's one beneath the cockpit sole here which again is is sealed uh, to prevent any any substantial water ingress right shall we make our way to the bow yes let's go forward So here forward, it's a relatively clear working area. You can see you've got uh, the furlers on the Genoa and on the staysail, and the removable forestay attaches here and uh, with the tack of the whatever headsail is going on there, attaches there. So it gets a bit congested in between. Um, and then uh, we're sailing with one asymmetric spinnaker and two symmetrical spinnakers. We have the two spinnaker poles, which will act as jury rigging in case of, uh, of mast failure. And then I've got a little jockey pole, which is the old spinnaker pole uh, for use with the staysail. So if we're going goose winged down, uh, downwind, because I know there are gonna be times like, for example, on the, on the race up from uh, the prologue race up from 
Gijón, um, where I would be using um, two head saws rather than the spinnaker, just to, to provide a bit of uh, steering capability and, and ability to move around the boat, let the hydrovane get on doing its job. Um, other than that, uh, there's nothing, I suppose the next significant thing is that uh, I've taken the choice of reefing, uh, do, so all halyard work and reefing is done at the, uh, at, the, at the mast rather than bringing it back to the cockpit. That's partly a function of the fact that the boat isn't really well set up to run everything back to, to the cockpit, but also the fact that by keeping it pretty simple and reducing friction and the amount of turns then, I'm hoping that, uh, I know that reefing at the mast is actually relatively straightforward and, uh, and it gets rid of a lot of the, the clutter and clobber, so she's got pretty clear decks, um, which is going to be pretty important for, for wandering around and working. So you're going to be okay with Southern Ocean coming up this kind of far out rather than just nestling down in the cockpit and controlling it from there? That's the only thing I would think. That... That's the plan. Yeah, okay. that's the plan. So, I mean, hopefully there's, broadly there's enough time and we've got just about enough information to, to be able to plan in advance and try not to leave everything to the last minute, which would be my normal practice in, uh, in racing. So I'll try and be a bit more conservative in this and, uh, and get any spinnakers out and gone before they get ripped to shreds or before I have to, to, uh, to, to, to go up on the foredeck in conditions that I'd rather not. Yeah. Um, so that's the plan. And of course, having rolling headsails, uh, furling headsails, is a big advantage in that context. Okay. And so if we move down, you can see, um, obviously, one of your solar panels there. Just Yes, that's, that's the only fixed solar panel that I've got. Mm -hmm. The village is beginning to wall wake yes, up so hear, yes. we'll have a bit of background music uh, <laughs> coming up soon. Okay. Um, apparently uh, my mast selection has caused a bit of interest because I've gone for a single spreader rig um, which is almost unique. Uh, the, the only other boat I think with single spreaders is the rather smaller rig boat behind us. Um, Why have you gone for single spreader? Um, well discussions, I'm not an expert. Uh, so I had discussions with, uh, with both the riggers and the mast makers and said what I wanted to achieve. And so we've gone for a heavier section of mast than might have been the choice and, uh, and saved the weight uh, with a single spreader rig, which, I mean, weight saving wasn't the critical item, but it's a balance of, of weight saving, strength, resilience. And, and this is what jointly, but predominantly the uh, the designers came up with okay. so uh, I'm not an expert in that I have confidence in the in in in, in the experts so okay. and who designed it uh, it was it was designed a, a effectively a combination between Sparcraft is the mast maker and Atelier Cable in uh, near near La Trinité are the uh, other riggers so it's a combination of the three of us I suppose okay so we go and look down below yep so down below, she looks like a pretty classic cruising boat, which is the objective of the, uh, the race. I mean, some boats will be a lot more stripped out than this. Um, but firstly, it's listening to the noise. It's, not, uh, it's nothing on board this boat. It must be background out there, I think. Oh, is it? Excuse me. Oh, it is. Yeah. That's better. <laughs> Sorry about that. Sorry. So um, a lot of this has all come out for the refit. So for example, we were talking about um, the hanging knees here for the, um, for the chain plates. So the chain plates are all brand new and these are now substantial. Uh, and again, bits have been carved out here so I could get behind and lay up and reinforce for the cap shrouds. And all these lockers in the heads all came out as well, so that again, I could expose the elements that needed re reinforcing. So although she's back looking pretty much as she was before, um, she has been taken apart pretty much completely. So I now know her fairly well. And uh, a forward is, yeah. I guess, a locker? Uh, forward is um, a selection of spinnakers. How many spinnakers are you taking? Take it, taking the three, two, okay. two symmetrics and one asymmetric. 
and uh, then just where the spinnakers are attached, bolted to, <laughs> clipped to forward, you can see the, the new watertight bulkhead and just below the clip there, there's a hatch to gain access. So that's full of um, empty bottles, recycled, <laughs> um, just in case we do hit something and get a crack in this water ingress. And then uh, for the rest of it, we've got the rest of the sails, got sort of hanging area, wet hanging area and uh, spare warps and such like. And then the storm sails are underneath in the, uh, underneath that um, platform. And then we've got the anchor and uh, anchor chain and so anchor chains as close to the mast foot as I can really. Um, and is that obviously just to keep the weight balanced? Yeah, mm -hmm. likewise you'll see that uh, the current position of the life raft, which needs to be fixed in, that's one of the, because we've only just taken delivery of the life rafts, but that's where I plan to sail with it, uh, simply because it is safer there, um, and the weight is better there, and if I need to get it out, I'll get it out, but I'm not planning on using it, because uh, we know these boats are incredibly solid. Uh, I'd be extremely surprised if anyone took the choice of going into a life raft rather than staying on their boat because uh, it, it, it would have to be something pretty extreme. Absolutely. Um, so that will be strapped there, keeps the weight right below the mast mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and that, that limits the, uh, the amount that it's being thrown around because it's a heavy lump. Mm -hmm. And likewise my water, spare water, because under here, I can show you, this is where my water is stored. Uh, in a 220 litre tank. So that's all been uh, redone, uh, recoated so that it's going to hopefully keep good fresh water, sweet water for the for the trip round. You've obviously got a water collection mechanism I imagine somewhere. Yes, uh, I have. Um, it's a pretty basic system. Um, so I'll have the 220 litres there, I'll have an extra 100 litres, 60 litres here and uh, in, in 20 litre cans and, and the rest. Uh, in That's quite a lot of water, are You the weight of that, are you...? It's, it's 320 kilos, okay. uh, 320 kilos uh, on a boat that is probably fully laden is about eight and a half tonnes. It's, yeah. It's a bit of weight. I've got about as much weight in food because I'm not taking dehydrated food because if you take dehydrated food, then you need to take the water. So there is, really isn't much point. And it's just as easy to store cans and, uh, and pouches uh, of wet food as it is the, the dehydrated. So that's my choice. Mm -hmm. People are taking different, different choices and different ways of doing it. You'll probably enjoy your food better. I might do. I mean, it isn't fantastic. I mean, it's supermarket cans, but actually, I think at sea, probably supermarket cans probably taste quite good. Especially and I've been testing French supermarket cans. Yes. Well, it's actually a bit of a mix. I've got French and, and English. There are some, some bits that, and I've got quite a selection and had great fun testing those all out over the last couple of years. And the photo behind you, is that your uh, daughter? No. No? Oh. <laughs> she would be very uh, thrilled to, that's, that's Claire, my wife, uh -huh. <laughs> but a few years ago, but not, not that many years ago. Um, but I do have uh, I do have a collection of my photo album of uh, of all the daughters who who are now all out here and all the rest of the family. So these these are going with me just to remind me that uh, that um, that I do have family back at home who I've been ignoring pretty comprehensively for the past and some cats <laughs> uh, pretty comprehensively for the last uh, last few years. Uh, so there's some make up time to be to be had. Yeah, I guess they're backing you and fully supportive of. Yes, I mean, they're used to you going off doing mini transats, and although yeah. obviously not as long as this race, but. No, and of course I'm not a professional sailor. I've done. You mentioned the mini transat. That's the longest I've done before. I've done a few fast nets, but those are going away. Even in the mini transat, you're away for a month and a half. Or it's it's not it's not quite the same as this. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so. They're, they're, they're more used to me being around and being a nuisance around the house so this will be a nice holiday for them <laughs> and so you've got your two um kind of bunks kind of yes here, i'll primarily be ready yes these are these are just to stop all the books yeah. and things flying out and then we've got lee cloths underneath yeah and then under here there's also um seat belts which are a requirement mm -hmm. this time so that we can uh clip ourselves in if we get into really heavy stuff, save, save being thrown around. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so this cushion goes off before the start and and I've got a sort of waterproof one here and a, and a beanbag type one that they'll all come. So my sleeping position will be on either of the berths, depending on whether I'm feeling very competitive and sleeping upwind or, or just comfortably downwind. And if it gets really rough, it'll be on the floor. There's mm -hmm. nice little, these, these cushions and mattresses go qu quite well on the floor. And obviously you've got your kind of barometer and yeah i've got the barograph below yeah. and the barometer on top and a ship's clock which uh keeps moderate time <laughs> um, yeah how yes because no, no nothing keeps perfect time how are you getting around that okay so i'm very fortunate this is my lovely uh watch from zero west one of my supporters mm -hmm. so they're a little company again based in emsworth this nice link with uh, with the hometown and they're a few doors down from where we live on uh, on uh, Bridge Footpath in Emsworth. And this watch is the very first watch they ever made. They're not a particularly old company, but they are recognizing historic events. So each watch that they produce is, is based on a time and place. And the time and place for this one is, it's called longitude, the bit starting of time really, or timekeeping for those who are interested in it. And of course, I happened to have the book with me just to reread uh, the story of Harrison and the H4. So the look of it is quite like the H4 and on the back it's got the uh, engraving of the original uh, H4 watch. And so they produce limited edition watches with great Swiss mechanisms that keep very good time. And they've lent me this for the, uh, for the race so on the promise that I take it back to them and, uh, and put it in their little museum uh, in Emsworth at the end of it, hopefully with a bit more history on it. <laughs> So that's so that's those are my primary timekeeping things, and then of course if we need to, we can try and pick up a, a radio signal for, mm -hmm. for just to to calibrate the mechanical timepieces. Yes, yeah, so let's have a look at your nav station, which um, yeah. isn't the it's a little bit cluttered, but you're getting ready to go, so that's fine. <laughs> yes, I mean here. So I mean this is the backup um, shortwave radio mm -hmm. that uh, will be coming out of its packaging, and the instruction manual's read and all that good stuff. Um, so that is back up in case there's a problem with the HF radio. So this is all part of the interesting part of Golden Globe races that you have to find all this relatively ancient equipment. So eBay's uh, the prime source of, uh, of a lot of equipment. So that with that, we'll be able to c communicate with other ships at sea, including our competitors, because uh, I think we're going to become great friends out there and uh, supporting each other in terms of weather and general sort of mental health issues, just somebody to talk to. Uh, uh, but also it allows us, we can have any communication we like with ships at sea, which is a tradition of the a tradition of the sea. And apart from that um, splitter up here that allows us to send, use the uh, weather facts, which is, is actually new for this edition of the, the race. Last time round in 2018, there were issues about who was receiving, which those who followed the race will remember about who's receiving what weather information. So this time it's been simplified. We do not have the right to communicate with any land station uh, with the HF radio, which most of us wouldn't have a license to do that anyway. Um, but we are allowed to pick up um, publicly available weather information and we can pick that up using the HF radio, which is always an issue, uh, a possibility. But this time we're allowed to take the, the, the traditional weather facts and pick up hopefully some isobaric charts. It's very difficult to test it out because here in the harbour there's too much interference with all the other masts and equipment so you can't actually do it here so you have to go offshore to test it but I'm confident that's going to work I hope. <laughs> and then this is obviously your kind of galley area. Yeah and general storage area. Yeah. <laughs> That'll be cleared before departure. Um, so yeah galley is as simple as you can get that's not actually the final gas bottle or anything that I'll be taking. So I'll be, that's the one I'm using at the moment and I'll replace it with new. But it will be jet boil for hot water because it's the most efficient way. Mm -hmm. uh, and then a single hob, which is a bit of backup um, and for heating all my canned food. Um, yeah, and then in the sort of sink area, we've got the, the little hand pump here is, um, is for fresh water. That means I'm going to be, I know exactly how much water I'm pumping out and I'll be logging that because there is a limited supply. <coughs> but I will actually be starting from the, the, the uh, jerry cans that I take. So I have a hand pump on that as well. That's a bit more visible because you can see how much you're using. 
Um, so it's quite important to control that. And then I've converted the water inlet or the exit from the sink so it does have a drain point. I haven't gone to the extreme of removing all all um, stopcocks and uh, and and uh, uh, hull fittings. Um, but I can convert this so that I can pump in seawater. So if I do want seawater for washing or whatever, washing up, then I can pump in reverse with the uh, with the other pump. I've got a foot pump down buried underneath uh, the bits down there. Uh, so, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. The sort of food is now all stored down well. So, I've got four lockers under under the seat. A bit difficult to access because you've got the uh, we've got the lee cloths under here. But got the lockers here. Here you can see the seat belts that swing around and buckle over the top. And under here you just have caverns full of food, which are all locked down in case of inversion. And those are split into legs. So I guess most people probably consider there are four legs to this race. We have two Atlantic ones, north and south, and the Indian and the Pacific. So I've got one one cavern for each uh, each leg and that pretty much goes in there there's a few extra bits to store elsewhere but that's that and then um one one of my secret weapons <laughs> it's not that secret is is um i've linked up with uh, a german company our head and they provide um some some rather good uh, i like anyway i mean this sort of thing is very personal but that's a full meal um, in terms of, and a very, very eatable under any circumstances meal. So those are my breakfast, but they can be any meal. So it's got all the nutrients, it's got the vitamins. So that's what I'm relying on for, for, for my for health. And they've got also fantastic chocolate bars and, uh, and, and some sort of energy um, uh, and recovery potions, which, uh, which I think are going to be really useful so I've got a huge number of those. So I've got um, basically one a day for all the way around, and they're going to be a godsend for me when I'm feeling rubbish and you just want, you just need energy quickly um, to go and do something, and you haven't got time to heat up a can of food. That's 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 my secret weapon. The other secret weapon is this. this is one of my favourite bits of the boat because she's quite beamy, very spacious, which is lovely. Um, but when 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 you're at hill and you're going through some rough weather. Uh, this this handrail, which was a relatively late addition, is is a godsend. Um, it's also very good for uh, packing spinnakers, attaching <laughs> attaching things. So sit here and just pack the spinnakers, which is which is really useful. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you, Simon. <laughs>